All right, well, we're back again. Jay Weiss Live. It is time for another episode with Sean McDonald. So welcome back again. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Johnny, I'm yes. Grant. We're going to get rolling now. So, all right, gun possession, gun laws in Texas. Um, I know the book is big as far Very. as what all the intricate parts are, but just to kind of give us a Reader's Digest version of gun laws in Texas in relation to possession, license to carry, that 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 kind of thing. So I think the best place to start is you don't have a license to carry a gun. You don't have a license to carry on your person. Can you possess a weapon and where and when? Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, the law boils down to this. You can have a weapon in your vehicle without a license. It has to be concealed. You can't be a gang member. And you can't be committing another offense other than the traffic fence for which you were stopped. Okay. If you meet those criteria, having the gun in your car is fine. Okay. The law. So you don't have to have a license to have a gun in your vehicle as long as it's concealed. Is that what you're saying? If that is correct, if okay. you can lawfully possess that weapon, you're not a convicted felon. Okay. You're not convicted of family violence. There's no protective order. Assuming all of that, you're just a regular citizen, clean background. You can ride around with a weapon in your car. Okay. Make sure it's concealed and you're not a gang member. Okay. So then it gets tricky on how do you get the gun to and from your car. Okay. So the, the legislature decided that they will allow you to carry your weapon to and from your car, from your house or your business. But where it gets tricky is you can't carry your gun from your house and your business to a car where you're a passenger that you don't have control over. Okay. So the statute reads, carry a gun in your car. You can carry it to and from your car if you're leaving your house or business. Mm -hmm. But you must be in control of the vehicle that you're getting in. Okay. So it could get a little tricky if you're getting in your buddy's car and you're carrying a weapon. It could get a little tricky. Okay. Um, I've never seen that charged, but it is a statute, so <coughs> you've got to be very careful with that. Okay. That's interesting information to know. Yeah. I mean... I never knew that. So... And I, I mean, I guess it's ultimately they want you to carry a gun in your car, not carry a gun in other people's car. Okay. I mean, I think that's what it boils down that's what to. what it sounds like. Yeah. So if the driver or the owner of the vehicle wants to carry a gun, great. But if you're a passenger going for a ride, then it's kind of frowned upon for you to carry a weapon in that vehicle. And that would just be as simple as proving your ownership. Because, I mean, you can own the car and not be driving it. So Correct. So you're just Correct. proving Absolutely. that ownership. Yeah, that you have control. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got it. And that's without a license. That is without a license. With a license, it doesn't matter. If you have Correct. a license, you can carry Correct. it wherever you, you want. Can, well, yes, with some well, restrictions. Well, almost, but yes. sure. Yeah. You can with, carry it without the 3006 and 3007. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And you can't go to a Texans game with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nowhere that sells tickets. All right. You are driving out of the state of Texas, and you don't have a license, and you're a passenger in a car. How does that work federally? Um, if, you're, if you're crossing state lines, you better be following the state law for the state you're going into. Okay. Now, federally, the feds don't get involved with minor possessions of handguns if you, say, are crossing state lines. They don't care. They're okay. not getting involved in it. They're not going to prosecute it for you. Now, if you have a kilo of cocaine in the back of the car <laughs> and you got a gun, That's that changes everything. Yeah, or 10 yeah. kilos of cocaine. Then yeah, they start yeah. charging you with possession of cocaine, having a firearm while in possession of cocaine. Yeah. Then they start getting involved. But as far as traveling across state lines, they typically almost exclusively leave that up to this to, to the decide, state to decide well and i think that most of all the neighboring states of texas you're legal to carry if you have a license to carry correct yeah if you don't have a license to carry then i'm sorry the question gets, was if you don't yeah yeah okay. if you don't yeah gotcha yeah if, if you're licensed to carry then you're, you're yeah there's reciprocity in the majority of states so if you have a ltc in texas can you carry your firearm in neighboring states or in other states yes there's the majority of states allow you and recognize your license to carry in Texas. There's some that don't. Um, and it, frankly, you just Google it, you know, Google reciprocity, Texas LTC. And um, I think uh, Texas law shield gives you a map that said that are green or red. Like you can go to these green states. You can't go to the red states. Gotcha. So majority of states, and especially all the contiguous states around us and all the way down the coast of Florida, all the way to Florida. Yeah. yeah so you can carry there. I've looked at that before because I've too. driven there. Uh -huh. Disney. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. You want to make sure you're good all the way through. Right. But it is important, though, if you're going to these 
if you're going to these states that you are at least somewhat aware of what they have in relation to those those laws, right? I mean, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, if not, you're opening yourself up to be arrested. Yeah, you don't want to drive to California. No. Yeah, no. You don't, <laughs> or New York. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to do that. And that's the thing. You still have a pretty extensive law in regards to guns here in the state of Texas, right? I mean, they make it sound like Texas is the wild west and you can just do whatever you want i mean there's there's still a lot of guidelines and rules that are applied when it comes to owning and possessing a gun right? oh yeah and i mean texas is is much more not much texas is more conservative than a lot of the states a lot of the states are constitutional carry you get to carry a weapon mm -hmm. uh, because it's that's the second amendment and we don't do a background check you don't need a license you get to carry unless you're prohibited from carrying because you're a convicted felon or you're convicted of, of domestic violence or you're on um, a protective order. Mm -hmm. So several states are going that way, and I think Texas ultimately will go that way as well, that you can carry a gun unless you're prohibited from doing so. Okay. And when you say inside of a car and it's concealed, what does concealed mean? It's not generally viewable. So some people, I used to have a Jeep, I would carry it under my steering wheel attached to the dash, but it would be right under my steering wheel. So if you kind of looked at my window and you looked way down there, you could see it. Okay. Now I carry it next to me, next to my seatbelt latch. Uh -huh. If you really look, you can see it. Okay. If you're a law enforcement officer and you come up to the window and you're looking way down by my leg, you can see it. Okay. Is that concealed? There's an argument both ways. Mm -hmm. um, because technically, where he's, if he has a right to be standing at my window and he sees it, it's not concealed. Right. Um, it's what we call plain view. So, you know, it's a bit of a gray area, but for the most part, I think you would be fine. So the three of us here have an LTC. So we have, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we've taken whatever proper steps in classes. According to what I was told in a class, it doesn't, if you have an LTC, it doesn't matter if it's necessarily hidden. It can be basically sitting on the front passenger seat. It just has to be inside of a holster. Or a is that correct? Correct. So now it's well the, since they passed open carry. Right. Okay. Yeah. So but open carry is what what makes that happen. And it that can get interesting because it's it has to be in a belt or shoulder holster. So if it's on your front seat, it's not in either. It's not on a sh in a shoulder holster. It's not attached to your belt. Mm -hmm. I have to check the statute. That could get a little tricky. Okay. If it's sitting on your front seat in plain view, I think you may have a problem. Okay. Now, if it's on your hip, right. or it's in a shoulder holster, you're fine, plain view. Okay. But I believe if it's plain view, it must be attached to you or concealed. Okay. It's been a while since I've taken the class, so I, I'm just trying to remember. But I I thought somebody had brought that up about. Because the big thing now is if you're going to have it concealed, you're going to have it in a holster. And that's, and they asked, in what degree is that where you can have it in a holster? And I, and I thought, again, that was what I, like a year and a half ago. Right. So it was in the front seat in a holster that it was, it was okay. But I mean, I think I, it I needs to be concealed. Okay. I think. All right. Well, that's probably good measure too. If you have a gun that's laying around, you get pulled over, throw it in the glove box real quick. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I mean, one to I, stay out of trouble, but two, so the officer doesn't see the gun and that could get interesting, get defensive, because then the officer sees you throwing stuff in a glove box and reaching in the glove box, it tends to make him a little nervous. Well, and I think that goes back to what you said in our last conversation about marijuana laws: is best way to handle any situation you're pulled over by the police, just stand there with your feet up or your, feet up, <laughs> your hands up to where it's visible they can see it and you should you know just follow the instructions and, and not be reaching for stuff and reaching if you're moving there. around they're getting nervous okay they just are i mean that's just the nature of what they do now yeah yeah it's scary stuff for them sure i don't absolutely. know what they're walking up on I, we had some questions from some people like i said on social media i want to go ahead and ask one that was um that was brought up this this question was brought up by Alexander Jones. After five years of being off parole, can an ex-felon own a handgun legally? Inside of his house. Never outside of his house. So five years post-release from parole or probation, after the five years, he can possess a weapon inside of his home, but he never can leave the home without, or leave the home with that weapon, ever, for the rest of his life. But he can have it inside the home for protection. Okay. And when a person has something where they're an ex-felon, they can never get a LTC. They can never get a license to carry. Never. Okay. Yep. They're they're prohibited because it's a separate statute. 
mm-hmm. unlawful possession of a firearm by a felon. I mean, it's against the law for a felon to possess a firearm okay. outside of their home. So, I'll And is that on a federal level? <clears throat> There's a statute federally as well. But to it, where you can't go from one state if you're in Texas and have a felony conviction here and you move to a different state where you're clean, uh, you know, say Florida, because their laws are similar, can you then possess a gun in Florida? Or does that, I would assume, the record follows you around? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're convicted in Texas and you go to Florida and their Florida is against the law for a felon to possess a firearm, then... You're yeah. a felon, you're a felon. That's right. Gotcha. What, for for those that don't know, what would constitute somebody being an ex-felon getting out? Like, what what is what does that look like? Well, there's, you know, you can... There's two different ways you can be, um, uh, well, let me back up. You can be placed on deferred. Okay. And if you successfully complete the deferred, you're never convicted. They defer a finding of guilt. So if, say, you committed a burglary, you're placed on deferred, you successfully complete the deferred, you can possess a firearm. Okay. If you're on deferred and you violate your conditions of probation and then they revoke you and convict you of burglary and send you to prison, now you're convicted. Or if they don't offer you a deferred, they offer you a straight probation, you're convicted. Okay. Therefore, you can't own a firearm. So it's the convicting aspect of the offense, not that it's a felony. It's whether you're convicted or not. If you're okay. on deferred, you're okay because you're never convicted felon. Okay. Yeah, once you're convicted, that's what makes you the felon. That's right. And it's, you know, your first time offense, 90% of the time, you're going to be placed on a deferred. I mean, they're going to give you a second chance because being a convicted felon is, you know, horrific for you know, Many obvious reasons. reasons. Yeah. Getting a job and, you know, supporting your family and getting a hotel, you get an apartment and buying a house. That's all very difficult. Right. So we, they try to avoid that at all cost. Okay. All right. So you can take it. I mean, you can have one. You just can't take it outside the house ever for the rest of your life. That's right. Okay. Lisa Wallingford asked, what about caring in city council chambers? So that gets interesting. So the government cannot prohibit weapons inside government buildings. So there's been a lot of um, litigation and a lot of attorney general's opinions about the government saying you can't carry a weapon in here and putting up 36 or 3006 and 3007 signs prohibiting concealed and open carry. And so some individuals sued and eventually the court said, the only time the government can prohibit a weapon inside of a building is if it's a courtroom. So you'll see like the Fort Bend County Courthouse, the big courthouse with all the courtrooms. There's a metal detector at the front door. You cannot carry into that building because it's a courthouse. Right. There's courtrooms in there. But like city council meetings, you can carry. It's not a courtroom. It's only prohibited in courtrooms. So sometimes you'll have on the one side of a building, you'll have a JP courtroom can't carry in there they have a metal detector at the door going into the courtroom but on the right side they have it's in Fort Bend County they have um, Vincent Morales's office um, a county commissioner so they don't prohibit you from coming in the building they just prohibit you from going into the courtroom so you know it's it's okay as long as it's not a courtroom the government cannot prohibit you from carrying this may be a dumb question what what constitutes a courtroom what makes it a courtroom where you can't have it in there I know that's a vague judge. question. Judge? Judge? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if there's a judge, if it's... I mean, I'm sure it's defined under the code, but it's... So they know. have those hard <coughs> wooden seats. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, because... benches and... Well, man. I, I asked that question just because I, I know that you have all kinds of different buildings and you have all kinds of different areas where they're doing, whether it's a mediation or you're doing s- certain things where... You, you may be in front of a judge, but it's not a court proceeding. So that's that's why that's yeah, why I, I mean, asked that question. If it's a courtroom, even if it's not an official proceeding, if it's a courtroom, if it's where court is held, you're prohibited from carrying in there. Nobody's in there. Nobody's in there. Doesn't matter. Okay. Can't carry in there. Okay. What do you got, Johnny? I know you had some questions that you wanted to ask him. I think my questions are more related to uh, when you can protect yourself, when not to, uh, when to shoot, when not to, and. Um, you know, it's, I know there's different laws during the day versus at night as far as your house goes and uh, the surroundings outside your house. If somebody's breaking in your car, uh, I believe if it's, you know, after dark, you're allowed to uh, use lethal force or self-defense. Uh, if it's during the day, you might be in a little bit more trouble. So what is the law related to that? It gets very, very tricky. So 
I'm going to give you, I think it's, I'm probably better served by giving you the practical aspects of the law, and then I'll give you the law. The practical aspects of it is do not get in a gunfight over something other than someone else's life or your life or your family's life. Someone's breaking in your car. That is all, all excellent of us, advice. All, all of us want to go out there and stop the guy. But imagine what they're going to say at your funeral. You lost your life over a wallet. Hmm. Why get involved in a potential gunfight over property? It, you may be legally allowed to do it. It may be okay. You may be justified, and many people would do it. But in the end, if things go bad, that's the very last thing you want to do is lose your life over a wallet. Someone's harming your family. The conversation at your funeral is totally different. You know, he died a hero protecting his family, mm-hmm. not died a fool because he's trying to protect his wallet and gets in a gunfight over 50 bucks. And yeah, his radar stuff. got stolen. And That's right. <clears throat> so practically speaking is unless someone is about to be killed and you fear for your life, don't put yourself in a situation where you can get in a gunfight. It's just not worth it. And it's easier said than done. You look out your window and some kids, you know, trying to, to, to start your car. Of course you want to go confront them, but if he's armed, it could be a big problem. It could turn ugly really quick. Sure. Legally speaking, there's, it, it can get very tricky, but ultimately what it boils down to is you can use deadly force, like you talked about, if someone is stealing from you, theft, and you can't recover the, 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 the property any other way, or you are putting yourself at risk for being um, seriously injured if you don't proceed to protect that property. Meaning, if there's no other way to recover the property, number one, or you're putting yourself at risk for being killed or seriously injured if you don't confront this person. Um, and it's it ultimately boils down to reasonable. You know, that's what a jury has to decide is, is your behavior reasonable? Is it reasonable that someone, you know, say they try to rob you? They walk up and they try to take your wallet, but they don't have a weapon. Is it reasonable that you shoot and kill them when you never see a weapon? Probably not. It's a little gray area. If you have a 90-year-old lady and he tries to take her purse and she shoots and kills him, is that going to be reasonable? Most people would say yes. So that's why the statute reads the way it does is your behavior must be reasonable under the circumstances. Reasonable to you is not reasonable to an 80-year-old lady. Sure. Reasonable to me is not reasonable to a four foot ten lady that weighs eighty pounds, but she's the same age. Um, now, if you see a deadly weapon, that changes everything. Sure. And what I've always told my friends and family is, if you legitimately fear for your life, kill someone. But if you can't say that you legitimately, in your gut, at that moment, think you're going to die, don't do it. It's not worth it because ultimately, if you don't feel it in your gut, it's probably not reasonable. But everybody's had that feeling. They have that feeling in the gut of their stomach like, oh, no, this is bad. Right. This is going to go south really quickly. Yeah. And you know that this is a problem. If you get that feeling, you're going to have to justify it in court, potentially. And if you believe it in your gut, telling someone about that fear is much easier than you being unreasonable in how to justify your actions. Sure. So, you know, it's, there's, it's a long list of things where you can protect yourself. And, and, and what it boils down to is, is it reasonable and do you fear for your life? Yes, you can shoot and kill someone for criminal mischief at nighttime. They're spray painting your truck. You can shoot and kill them. Under the statute, you can. But you're going to have to live with killing somebody for someone causing a couple thousand dollars in damage of your truck. Okay, well, I, I tell you what, let's, uh, let's do this, Sean. Let's, let's move on to another Okay. Another uh, another viewer's question. So Benjamin Benjamin Brush asked, "What is covered under current background checks, reciprocity, as well as limitations on the carrying while crossing state lines for the states that oppose?" Which we already talked about. So what about open carry laws and their expansion limitations on concealed carry on universities? Gotcha. Okay. So universities is has been tricky. Um, and I know Benjamin had some concerns about universities 
severely restricting the carrying of weapons on campus. So you can carry concealed on university campuses, but the campus can restrict where you carry those weapons. And I, let me find out. I wrote some language down for it. I know that's a big issue, especially when you have a big college campus. So what, what it's, it's Senate Bill 11, and I'm going to read directly from the code just because it's kind of tricky language. Okay. Is that the campus may not establish provisions that generally prohibit or have the effect of generally prohibiting license holders from carrying concealed handguns on the campus of the institution. The institution of lo higher learning would exceed its authority if it prohibited guns from a substantial number of classrooms or allowed individual professors to choose whether guns would be allowed in their classes. And that's an attorney of general's opinion, um, Ken Paxton, back in 2015. That universities can't so severely restrict concealed carry on campus that it pretty much says you're not allowed to carry at all. They have to allow you to carry in certain places, and it has to be a institutional policy, not an individual teacher policy. Okay. So you can't, institution can't say, I'll allow you to carry in classrooms, and then the first day of class, your professor says, no, I'm not letting you carry in my classroom. Attorney General said, you can't do that. You either have to say they can carry in all classrooms or they can carry in no classrooms. They can carry in, you know, the student life center or they can't carry in the student life center, but they can't so severely restrict that, all right, we're not going to let you carry anywhere but at the fountain on the southeast corner of the campus. They can't do that, is according to the attorney general. So at some point, and there may be some litigation out there now, at some point someone's going to have to get arrested for violating the, the higher education institution's policy and they're going to have to litigate it and let the courts decide if that's so severely restricted that it's contrary to what the, the Senate meant. What is the current law about carrying guns to schools that are not college, junior high, elementary, high school? Premises. And premises are defined as buildings. You can carry in the parking lot. You can carry in the driveways. You can go through the pickup line with a gun in your car. You just can't carry inside the building. That's it. Period. Period. Okay. So you can go to a Texans game and have a gun in your car, but you can't carry it in the stadium. Um, and that law is because any place that sells tickets, is that accurate? Professional sports. Any professional sports? Professional sporting events, racetracks, or um, school events. Okay. Um, so the football games after school, you can't Absolutely. No, carry. you cannot. It's a school-sponsored event. And so there's some tricky aspects on, well, what if the basketball team after their game – is riding home on the bus and they just stop they decide to stop at Dairy Queen and you're inside Dairy Queen carrying your weapon. Oh, well, that should be fine. Is that a school sponsored event them stopping at Dairy Queen? They're on a bus, the driver's stopping, everybody is participating in it. It's a, it's an argued that it's a school it's it, 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 you can argue it's a school sponsored event. Now, are they again discretion? But it, you know, at some point, someone's going to have to litigate that issue because it could be argued that that is a school-sponsored event and you're carrying a weapon at a school-sponsored event. Well, the question I would have is what would make it a school-sponsored event? Like what if, the, what if the families are paying for their own kids' meals? Like at that point, you know I mean, what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the different ways to argue. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's the first thing I thought of. Like what makes that? I know. And I know we could probably sit here and do this with everything that absolutely. we're talking about. And, and I just, when I think of things, I, I ask that, but generality, just so people know like what those rules are. And, and that's what we're, that's what we want to let people know yep. is what you said. Yeah. Don't go in a building. Parking lot's fine. Parking lot's good. That's right. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of parents that drive with guns in their car to pick up their kids or. Absolutely. You know, and Absolutely. To, well, and that brings me to a couple of questions about parents with guns. I mean, we're all parents. We all carry guns. Uh, we have license to carry guns. And this isn't about having a license or not. Let's just assume everybody has a license. Uh, but as far as, you know, my wife carries guns. Uh, we have guns in cars and purses by the beds. Uh, we carry them in safes. We put them in uh, floor safes or wherever we need to have them. But what is the actual law as far as uh, if I'm having, you know, my kid is having friends over, they're hanging out, they get into a drawer that has a gun, uh, they shoot themselves or shoot somebody else on accident. So first aspect is the gun needs to be loaded, meaning there needs to be a magazine with bullets in the magazine. It does not need to have one in the chamber. And then the statute reads that it's readily, and I'm going to quote it, readily dischargeable firearm. 
So the child gains access to a readily dischargeable firearm and the adult fails to secure that firearm or left the firearm in a place to which the person knew or should have known the child would gain access. So if you have a loaded firearm, it better be somewhere that the child cannot gain access or you can be charged. Now, if Meaning the gun is a safe or with a safety lock on it. Absolutely. Um, or a gun that's not loaded, then you're okay. But you know, you're better off having a club then. I don't know why you would have a gun that's not loaded. But. Yeah. So just don't make your firearms accessible to, to kids under the ages or 17 and younger. Um, you know, it gets a little tricky when you have a babysitter. If the babysitter is 18 or older, then it, it, it seems to give you a defense that you didn't make the firearm readily accessible. It's the 18 year old babysitter that didn't watch the child close enough. But if it's a babysitter that's younger than 18, then it still falls on you. All the different ways that you it's, can. I know, it's tricky. <laughs> I mean, it's why I brought my, you're like, wow, you brought your code. And I'm like, I know, because it gets, the language gets so tricky and there's so much gray area that it's. There is. Well, and it's, I carry in my car. Um, and I notice you carry in your car, uh, but you store yours in a safe when you're not in your car. And yes. You take it in and out of a safe. Yes. So I'll either carry mine on myself or in a glove box when it's not in my lap or next to my leg. Um, so if somebody was to uh, break into my car, two different scenarios. One is somebody breaks into my car. Let's say the neighbor's kid is 15 years old. He comes and breaks into my car because he sees the gun laying on my seat and he takes it, plays with it, shoots himself or shoots, you know, Timmy down the street. Am I responsible? Um, first let's ask that. No. So they can't be viol If, if a child gains access to a firearm, they can't be violating any law, meaning they can't be breaking in your car. They can't be breaking in your house. They can't be committing a theft. They can't be doing any of those things. And, and it, and again, the code reads was gained by entering property in violation of this code. So if they gained access to whatever property where your gun is located, it's a defense for okay. you that they so violated. he broke the law by breaking in my car therefore i'm not responsible absolutely that's right okay that's right but if i invite little timmy over and take him to the grocery store with me and he reaches down and he hits a trigger and shoots himself then i'm liable yeah and he doesn't even have to shoot himself if he reaches down and grabs a weapon and happens to even shoot it and somebody calls the cops you've made that firearm readily available, a dischargeable firearm readily available to Timmy. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, law to highlight on. It, it doesn't matter if they grab the gun or shoot it or use it. It's if it's accessible to a child. Right. I mean, in the code You're breaking reads, a law. Basically, if you have a gun in your house, in your car, in your purse, anywhere that is accessible to a child, whether they use it or not, you're immediately violating the law. The child has to gain access to it. So the child has to somehow get a hold of the weapon is how I would read that. Okay. Um, and that could be as simple as touching it. Doesn't mean they have to shoot it or hold it or hide it or carry it. If, 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 they, have, if they access, and that's an interesting word that the legislature uses, they have access, mm -hmm. they've accessed that weapon. Mm -hmm. that, that's a crime. Because then what it makes me think of, and again, you could, get, you could start um, cutting hairs when it comes <coughs> to this kind of stuff, but... I think about if you had a gun, like I, I have younger kids and have a gun and you know, if you have a gun inside the closet on a top shelf that they can't really reach, I mean, that's, that's not accessible for them, correct? Well, and the code says left the firearm in a place to which the person knew or should have known the child would gain access. So if you have a three-year-old child and you hide in the top of your closet, there's no reason to believe that a three-year-old is going to figure out how to climb to the top. Number one, how to climb that high. Number two, how to climb that high in your closet. Right. I think you're, you know, safe. But now if you're talking about a seven-year-old, that could be a little different. They're a little more um, creative. They could gain access to the top of your closet. Right. And should you have known that they could gain access to the top of your closet. Right. And it's, I think that, again, goes to that reasonableness that we talked about in self-defense is should have known. That right. can get interesting. And right. I think that that's directly related to age of your child. And and I think it's like what we talked about earlier. It just gets down to what's reasonable, like you said, what's reasonable, what can be proved and, and proven and not proven. Right. right. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what it all comes it's down to. So much to gray that. area. I mean, that's why they call it a practice of law is we never really always know. It's, it's always changing. There's always court opinions coming down that would, that, that change the law every day. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and we have to stay up to date on that. And at some point you just can't, you just have to, and that's why I have my, my, my penal code here is because I can refer to it because there's some answers I don't know. There's just no way to know. So when you have an attorney general that is making that, you have that in your, in your code here, is that because that's code or law that has been passed by Texas legislature or that is based on his findings of court proceedings? That is his interpretation of the law. Okay. And it, and it, and, and it typically is coming from a government agency is saying a college, University of Texas is saying, okay, you've passed this law. We don't know how to interpret it. So we are going to ask the attorney general of Texas to issue an opinion on how we should interpret this law. Okay. And give us some guidance, essentially, is what they're asking for. We want some guidance. And that's what Ken Paxton or the, whoever the attorney general is. Right. Is Ken Paxton now is, here's what we believe. Here's some guidance on how to follow this particular law. And he only does that, not always. He does, majority of time, he does that for a government organization. So he's doing that of his own. That's not necessarily, so if, it, if you have a different attorney general, that could change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And someone requested it. Someone sent a, a request for an attorney general's opinion. Okay. And then he responded to it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, AR pistols. <laughs> <laughs> you like this one, huh? Uh, Do you get enough of it? I've, I've, I've dealt with a little bit of it. Have you from a, uh, a representing side? I have not. Okay. I have not. You just don't see it much. Yeah. Have you seen it here in Sugarland at all? No. Can I interrupt him before he asks that question? What, yep. Why the response like that? The ATF is, I think they're overwhelmed with how to handle all the influx, the influx of ARs and AR pistols and bump stocks and what's a pistol and what's not a pistol and how does the um, the stock look and how does it feel and is there a support for your hand on the pistol it's so i think that's worse than the laws the penal laws in the state of texas it's yeah. so confusing and yeah. so difficult to follow um and so that's why i just i don't even deal with the pistol grip <laughs> I stuff. Guess, yeah. for a little bit i did so i was waiting on my license but yeah i don't want that up for interpretation i right. don't want somebody else making a decision whether this is a, a pistol or not right i don't i want to i want to say look i it's not a pistol. I have a license to have it. Right. I'm not going to leave it up to your discretion. I, I just don't want to put myself in that position. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, when you asked that oh, question, okay. he responded like well, that. I was just curious to know why. Owning a gun shop for many years, you know, a lot of the laws did change during my time mm -hmm. of owning a shop. It went to where uh, an AR pistol is a, I mean, it's basically an assault rifle uh, that has a different type of stock on it to be considered a pistol or it has a buffer tube or no stock at all, and then it's considered a pistol. And it makes no sense whatsoever. It does it looks exactly like an AR rifle. It looks, it functions, it acts, it's the same exact. If you ask a general citizen, I would say 90% of the people are like, that's a rifle. That has a, that looks exactly like a rifle. It shoots like a rifle. It sits up against your shoulder and you can, it's as accurate as a rifle, but they call it a pistol because the stock looks a little different. Well, and the law used to be is, is and I don't know the exact verbiage for it, but basically if you would shoulder it, then it was illegal to shoulder a pistol. Uh, but I believe that law has changed to where now you can shoulder an AR pistol. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That's my understanding as well. Okay. You just can't have a regular stock on it. It has to have something that looks like a pistol brace, that a brace that you can attach to your arm, but you could still shoulder it. It's well, and there's actually uh, stocks now, uh, or they're called cheek rest, where it's just a cheek rest and it doesn't even have to be a brace anymore. Yeah. I mean, the blade, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, I, I would not, I don't envy the position of, of someone in charge at the ATF having to make these decisions because they're difficult to make. I mean, you, you know, you have the second amendment, but then you have, you know, you want to, for whatever reason, try to limit people's access to, you know, short barrel rifles and suppressors. Um, so it's, you know, you're having to make these decisions and it affects tens of thousands of people on any given day. And you just, you know, and it's always changing. Like you said, since you've been building rifles, it's changed. And if you're not up to date on the law, you know, God forbid it changes where it's more restrictive and you don't know it. The next thing you know is you're getting charged federally for having a, a weapon that you don't have a license for. Yeah, from a consumer standpoint, but even from a business standpoint, owning and running a business, you're selling these items, you're building these items, you can build business models around these items. And if they change the law one day because they decide to, then it can put you out of business. 
Yeah, and they're much more likely to come after you for selling illegal weapons than the guy that's buying them. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's I I wouldn't be in that business. Yeah, well, I'm not anymore. <laughs> Good move. Yeah. <laughs> well, just because of all the different change. I mean, you're constantly rolling over administrations. You're constantly rolling over congressmen and 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 uh, legislature and and I just I, and what I they just, choose to to enforce. Right. I mean, uh, marijuana is still legal federal illegal federally. Mm -hmm. All these states that are legalizing it, if the feds wanted to, they could go out and arrest all of these people that are selling and using marijuana in these states that have made it legal. They just choose not to. They're not. They just chose not to enforce that law. It's the same thing. Is sometimes you'll have a, a an administration that chooses not to be as strict, like immigration. Trump's really strict on on illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. Barack wasn't so strict. Maybe the next president won't. So they don't enforce it as much. So not as many people are are, are um, charged with uh, entering the country illegally. So I, I want to go back to a question that somebody asked. Um, so we have somebody uh, on social media, E.J. Davis, asked, and I'm just going to read what he what he wrote here. Okay. He said, a buddy was in a bad spot, and he lent him money based on giving him uh, a few guns as collateral. Okay? Uh, he said, well, he, ne he never saw the money again. So he said, if, he, if, if I want to sell, gun, sell the guns, is it legal? The guns are not registered in my name. Is that legal that I even have them? If I want to keep them, do I need to register them in my name? If yes, how do I do this? So... Let me understand the question. Is somebody owed him some money, and instead of giving him money, they gave him some guns. As collateral. As collateral. Correct. They never brought back the money, so EJ still has the guns. Correct. That's right. And he wants to know if it's legal to keep them, have them. Uh, they're, from, yeah, they're not registered in his name. Is that legal for him to have them? If he wants to keep them, does he need to register them? How does he do this? And so forth. He should keep them and not register them. Yeah, there is no registration in Texas. You can't even, there's not possible to register a firearm okay. in Texas. Okay. Um, the only time you ever register as a firearm is if you have a firearm that you have to register a short barrel rifle or a suppressor. But there is no register, like you could, there's no possible way for you to buy a firearm and go register in Texas. There is no database to register firearms. So he has a right to own those weapons or have those weapons. Now, civilly, maybe a different story if there was some agreement like, hey, I'm giving you these for six months. I'll pay you back in six months, and in four months he sells all these guns. Well, he could be liable civilly, but criminally, if he has the guns, he has a right to sell the guns unless they're stolen. Okay. But right now, from his question, he has a right to possess those guns, and he can sell those guns. He can do whatever he wants. That's them. right. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't. There, have to, there is a a log book, uh, a AD book or acquisition disposition book that gun shops use to log in books and log out books mm -hmm. or guns uh, in the books, so that if the ATF ever comes by, they can see who's purchased and who hasn't um but as far as if he gets guns off the street or at gun shows or garage sales or any other means online uh and it doesn't go through an ffl then there's no way to register it one of the things that you hear a big deal about now are at least for for the current legislature in regards to gun purchasing at gun shows what what is it about purchasing at gun shows that they're so concerned about in relation to uh, getting them, I guess, legally? I mean, because they make it sound like anybody can just go into a gun show and purchase a gun. Every time I've, I think there's two different aspects. Every time I've gone into a gun show and bought a gun, they do a background check. And I think because they're FFLs. Okay. Um, I think what they're talking about or what a lot of the fuss is about is there's people that go to gun shows just right. like average people with guns in their backpack and they're put signs on them saying hey you can buy my gun okay and, and you know, all the booths that are set up it goes through a process that is logged in and logged out yeah. uh, but if anybody's walking around with a, a rifle or a gun or pistol or whatever type it is that they want to sell there's no paperwork to that okay and there's no way for the seller to do a background check on the buyer. So I think that's where the fuss is or the gray area where people can actually look for somebody selling a gun off their back, buy it, and there's no paperwork or no paper trail. It's like you selling me a gun. Okay. That you don't know I'm not a convicted felon. Right. You have no idea, but you still can, in a hand-to-hand -hand tra transaction, sell me a gun. Now, if you have knowledge, that's different. You can be, you can be charged. Okay. But if you have no knowledge, I'm like, Hey, I, you know, I like your gun. You sell it to me. Sure. 500 bucks. All right. Here's 500 bucks. Okay. Can you legally own this? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. See you later. Okay. 
So I think, so gun shows, they say that. Every gun show I've ever been to, they do do a background check. But again, like Jonathan said, if there's somebody walking through and you want to buy their gun, there is no background check. And, you know, you can look up on Craigslist or Facebook, someone's selling a gun, you just go to their house and buy it. But what, a law, what would a law even do in that regard? I mean, you know what I mean? You can't, you can't help people. Just because there's a law, as we know, and as I'm sure you know, just because there's a law doesn't mean people are just going to stop doing it. I mean, that's if you make that more difficult, it's still going to happen. Well, of course. So the criminals don't follow the laws to begin with. They're not going to start all of a sudden start following those laws. Right. I mean, if, 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 you, are, if you want to go kill somebody, you're not going to go to a store and legally buy a gun. You're going to probably steal it, and right. you don't want it traced to you. Right. So, you know, adding more laws... It, it doesn't seem to serve much purpose. I mean, there's the criminals don't follow the laws to begin with. I know you own a gun, and so you are pro Second Amendment. What what is your what is your just what you know legally and what you are as a gun owner, as far as how far Texas law reaches in covering covering people, and where it may be missing. Do you, do you see what, do you see the question I'm mean? asking? What do you mean? Like, is it it. The, do you think Texas laws covers enough? Do you think it doesn't cover enough? What What is your opinion about Texas gun ownership and gun carry laws? Well, I think, you know, like we talked about earlier, having a gun in your vehicle without a license, that you can't have a gun if you're not in control of that vehicle. Right. You can't carry a gun concealed right. if you're in someone else's vehicle. I think that's a, kind of semantics. It's like, well, if they're going to let you have a gun in your car, why can't you have a gun in your friend's car Right. if it's your gun? Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you can lawfully possess it. Uh -huh. So I think that, you know, we, you get some laws that haven't really caught up with the times. And I think that's something that'll probably be ultimately changed. But Texas pretty pro carry. I mean, they're not a constitutional carry mm -hmm. um, yet, but I think we're getting there. And it's, and it's, you know, it's baby steps. When we first passed the, the concealed handgun carry law, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be like the wild west. This is going to be shootouts all the time on the streets. And, mm -hmm. And, you know, statistics have found that, that, that LTC carriers or holders are less likely to commit a criminal offense than police officers. Wow. And so now they're like, well, okay, so we've allowed all these people to have a handgun, and it's been ex so extremely effective, and none of these people are committing crimes. I think it's less than 1%. It's like 0.8%, I think. Why don't we, wh why are we so concerned about more people handling weapons don't we want more people who don't commit crimes the good guys to have guns right that clearly it prevents crime and protects people mm -hmm. so i think that that making that law broader and allowing more people to carry a weapon without having to pay the money and go to all these classes is something that people and legislature are starting to look at that maybe this is a solution mm -hmm. and you see it with allowing teachers to carry in classrooms so being less restrictive is what you're saying yes okay yes. What, when you say constitutional carry, what do you what, what what's your it, Second Amendment allows you to carry a firearm. Period. That's right. Okay. Therefore, so how is how is the government restricting your carrying I'm a with firearm? You. I'm with Why, you. How can the government make you go to a class? How can the government make you pass a test? Okay. When the Second Amendment says you have the right to bear arms. I got you. It's like the government is the government is restricting your right to bear arms by placing some would argue unreasonable restrictions and, and burdens to be able to to exercise that constitutional right. Okay. Because you hear that now. That's the argument, is that it's not... The people on the other side of it just make it sound like anybody can just go get a gun and you can... And it's, you know, anybody can walk up and do that. And that's not the case. It's not. I mean, it's 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 far from the case. I mean, it's, it's very... Because we, we've all gone through the process. I went through the process. I got fingerprinted. I had to answer questions. I took the class. I was there for a long... I mean, it's... It's... it's, it's pretty extensive yeah i mean not only you're a law-abiding citizen but you're a law-abiding citizen that's committed to being able to protect your family and have to go through and jump through all these hoops to carry a weapon correct and it's you know by and large those are the the um most lawful people on the planet right the ones that go through that process and carry a weapon absolutely for sure what else you got, Johnny? You got any other questions you want to ask i'm good you're good uh my question is what is the next show going to be about sean let me check, see if anybody's asking any more questions. I posted it on my, nope. You know what, I, I will ask you this. Can you, because people like stories, can, can you just kind of go into a little bit what you were talking about earlier before we got, got back on in relation to your scenario about just the um, interpretation of certain things, the man, people get in an accident and the gentleman walks up. Oh, gotcha. So there was a case, I don't know, three or four or five years ago 
I believe there was an accident between a male and a female, and they pulled in the gas station like they should, and the male approached the female's vehicle and I believe was trying to get her information to file on her insurance or her driver's license. Um, I believe law enforcement was called, and he was knocking on the window or banged on the window, and at some point she pulled a weapon and shot and killed him. Mm. And so, you know, under the code, if if you're if someone is attempting to carjack you, it is, and the code finds that it's um, presumed to be reasonable that you shoot and kill them, um, if it's immediately necessary. So the argument was, well, was he trying to carjack her, or was he just knocking on the window trying to get information? And I don't know how that case turned out, but I, I when it happened, I put it on my Facebook page that this was going to be an interesting scenario yeah. to see how this played out. Um, was she, and again, was she reasonable? You know, who was the guy that was knocking on the window? How aggressive was she being? You know, how how old was this girl? What size was she? You know, who caused the accident? There's so many factors that'll go, that'll come into play when, when the district attorney is making that charging decision that every case is different. So you just have to let it kind of play out. And ultimately, sometimes juries have to make that determination of reasonableness because what's reasonable to me doing what I do may not be reasonable to one of you. You know, and, and many people are like, why do you carry a gun all the time? That seems unreasonable. And I'm like, I, I, if you see and know what I know and see what I see every day in the courtroom and the amount of people who are charged with crimes and the amount of, and some of the people I represent, you would carry, you would think, well, absolutely. You deal right. with some really bad people all the time. But right. to somebody that's never involved in this line of work, that's maybe a school teacher, like, well, that seems unreasonable that you carry a gun everywhere you go. Right. So again, it's that reasonableness that, that someone has to make that decision. And that's what we talked about, and, and which is why I think you were a little bit, when questions are asked like this of you, there's a difference between legality and just reasonable making the right decision. Right. And your job, at least, or an attorney's job, is to get that in between and, and get that gray area and, and bring it to a head and bring it to a decision. And so, right, she said, there may be a law that says, okay, yeah, it's okay to shoot somebody in this particular situation, but is it necessarily the right thing to do or the, or the proper thing to do? Sure. I mean, I best if you went and asked this girl what she, if she has any regrets about shooting and killing someone when she could have drove off. And could she drive off? Right. I mean, is she in a position that she can drive off? Right. Yeah. I mean, I bet in hindsight she would say, oh, I should have drove off. I killed somebody. I have to live with that the rest of my life. Even I may have been justified. Right. I had another option potentially. I could have just drove off. Yeah. And my ego got the best of me. It, it's, man, it's, it's, it's crazy. All the, I mean, like you said, you got this big thick book here then, and the reasons why it just explains all the different avenues you can go with that. So well, one last question that I have is related to if somebody does have to use deadly force for self-defense, what should they do immediately afterwards? Leave. If you have to use deadly force, that means that person is likely armed and was trying to harm you. If you if that if if you stop that threat and you have the ability to get back in your car or get your family away from the scene, there's no reason for you to sit and wait and for him to get back in the fight. If you can safely leave after using deadly force, you get on the, you you leave and you call 911 and you go somewhere safely and say, "Look, I just got in a shooting." I don't know if he's dead. I don't know if he's incapacitated. He had a weapon. I'm not going to stick around to see if he can get back in the fight. I am. I could safely leave because he was on the ground and not moving. I'm getting my family out of here. We can deal with this in an hour when law enforcement gets him in custody and he goes to the hospital. I'm not going to stick around and hold him at gunpoint and wait for this guy to wake up and grab his gun and start shooting at me again. Get out of there. Well, and I know in some of the courses or classes, you know, they're immediately call 911, call for an ambulance, say that you're trying to help him in case, you know, he needs to be revived or he's not dead yet. Uh, A lot of the courses that I have taken myself as well as heard from others that they once you stop the threat, they then want you to turn into rescue mode. That's 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 rescue mode is EMS and police. You're not you're not in the in the rescue business. You're in the I'm protecting my life and my family business. I'm getting out of here. I'm getting my family in the car and we're leaving. Someone else can save this guy's life because I'm soon as enough I save this guy's life and he wakes up and he wants to start fighting. And now his gun's in the fight and the gun I have on me is in the fight. I, I'll i pass. Get me away from the scene. Get me somewhere safe because I don't want to die. Cool. You know, that's that's your goal is stay alive. Don't get in a fight because someone's stealing your wallet. Your goal in life is to stay alive. You know, don't don't lose your life over 50 bucks or someone, you know, keying your car. It's not worth it. Yeah. Even if you may be legally justified. Right. And if you can do anything you can possibly without shooting and killing someone, do it. 
so it should be your absolute last resort in your mind. I'm going to die if I don't do something. If you think that, in the end, you're going to be okay. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah. Excellent Enjoyed information. It. Yeah. I hope people got something out of it. I know I did. I know you answered some questions for me and some things that I was curious about. Yep. And I, again, I'll just go back. What you said I thought was great. Just think about, is it worth a wallet or is it, are you protecting a wallet or your car or are you protecting your life? Mm -hmm. Like that's really what it comes down to. And just think about it in, in that term. I think it's, I think it helps you make the right decision. I think so too. I mean, that's, that's what I think of yeah. is if someone's going to get killed then I can get involved. If someone's, you know, if I'm losing property, I'm not, I'm not getting involved. Right. So if you're watching and listening, send us on, contact us, J Weiss marketing, correct? Yes, sir. On social media, give us some uh, comments, ask us some questions that we can ask Sean if you need to know, because I know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I know what happens. And it does. Uh, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. I know I do. I'll have some. So Yeah. So next month, we're going to be doing a uh, segment on DUI. So any questions related to that, please leave them in the comments. Um, send us DMs if you want to re remain anonymous, and we will get those answered for you here on the show. Sean, thanks again. No this, problem. This thanks for having good. me. Always yeah, learn something. It. Johnny, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Hector, appreciate you uh, doing what you thanks, do. Thanks, buddy. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you all. Right. all. Take, Take care. care.